Israel is this morning expanding its ground operations in Gaza. Troops have entered Gaza for a second night and CNN is reporting a large series of explosions in Gaza City, outgoing tank fire and unusual intense and sustained military activity for the past few hours. Last night, before that incursion began, I spoke to Major Libby Weiss. She is a spokesperson for the Israeli Defence Force in Tel Aviv about whether a full ground inv invasion is now imminent. The IDF is preparing for a ground invasion into Gaza. We've seen tanks moving inside in the past 24 hours. Is planning finalised for a full ground invasion? And is there political consensus on whether it will definitely go ahead? Well, any decision around a ground invasion is something that the political echelon would have to make. Uh, we in the IDF are continuing to prepare for whatever decision may be made. Uh, and of course, there's a variety of factors that go into making that decision. But from the perspective of the military, we are preparing every day, uh, continuously making sure that we are in a position to respond to any uh, order that we may get from the government. Libby, what is the goal? What does it mean to destroy Hamas? Uh, and how will you know, I suppose, when you have dismantled Hamas? Well, after the events of October 7th, it's very clear to every Israeli that we can no longer live with Hamas as a terror organization next door to us. We, we've really adopted a new paradigm in our thinking now. And for us, the understanding is a clear one. And that means that Hamas can never be in any kind of position of power within the Gaza Strip to continue launching attacks against Israelis. And that means both uh, in the military sense as a, as a terror organization, and of course, we know how many resources resources have been invested in Hamas as a terror organization, but also in their administrative capacity. And we understand that what happened on October 7th was their goal. And if given the opportunity, they, they will do that again and will slaughter innocent Israelis at any opportunity that they have. I want to ask you, Libby, about uh, the hostages, those 200 people uh, who were taken on October 7th. Do you have any update on them at all? Well, we know that very few have been uh, have been released, and of course, we're, we're very happy for those who have been released. Uh, but there are 224 who are still being held, and the 224 range from very, very, very young children to elderly people, clearly civilians, families, uh, and we're deeply, of course, concerned about their well-being. Uh, we know that Hamas last week released a video of a 21-year-old Mia Shem, who was one of the hostages. Hostages. And we understand that they're releasing these videos and their communication around the hostages hostages is, of course, a type of psychological warfare that they're waging against the public. And we, we hope that the international community can join us as we call to Hamas to release them immediately. That is the fastest way that they can come home safely, uh, is for them to be released immediately without any preconditions or terms. Well, let me does a ground invasion put those hostages in more danger? Well, there's no question that it's a complicated operational reality. And of course, we have two goals. And the goals are to have those hostages come home. They are a top priority for us. Uh, we think about them as a country constantly. And we have very few degrees of separation to them. We're a small country. Uh, many of us know people who are being held hostage or people who know people. So we are our hearts are with them and we are thinking about them all the time. Uh, and of course, we have another goal. And that goal is to make sure that Hamas can never do this again. And and both of those goal ex goals exist, uh, and we are operating to accomplish both of those. Well, there's a, um, the bombardment now, which has been happening, has certainly been having an impact in Gaza. The Hamas-controlled um, health ministry there says 6,000 Palestinians in Gaza have been killed in this bombardment so far. And the UN is reporting that a million people are displaced. Uh, that people are trying to evacuate northern Gaza, but they're just not able to. to. And the UN is um, saying that this is quickly turning there into hell on earth. Well, first, I would be very skeptical of any figures that Hamas is putting out. Uh, and we have called for several days for the residents in the northern Gaza Strip to move south. That was a message that the IDF provided. Uh, you can imagine it's to our operational detriment to be very clear about that. But we are doing it because we are the only party in this conflict that has any interest in minimizing the impact on civilians. Uh, it is up to Hamas as the sovereign within the Gaza Strip to facilitate the movement of civilians 
civilians away from the areas that we have identified. Uh, and they are not doing that. And it speaks to, I think, the complete lack of regard that they have for their own civilians within the Gaza Strip. Uh, and, and just as for contrast, we, we have evacuated our civilians uh, from the south as well as from the north, more than 200,000 Israelis, with the goal of keeping them away from the violence. And it's it's uh, distressing to understand that Hamas, as the sovereign within the Gaza Strip, uh, not only is not, they're not evacuating their civilians, they're making it very hard for the civilians to independently evacuate. Uh, but I, I believe that the international pressure needs to be put on Hamas to allow civilians to move and to follow the instructions that we provided them several days ago. Well, well there's growing international um, pressure, including from our own government here in New Zealand, for a humanitarian pause to the military conflict in Gaza uh, to establish those uh, humanitarian corridors for water, food, fuel, for example, medicines and other basics of life. So far, Israel is refusing um, to do that. Why? Well, we are facilitating the entrance of humanitarian aid that is coming in, and we know that Hamas has fuel. We know that fuel that was in the Strip is being taken by Hamas for their own purposes. Uh, but I think it's understandable that we, A, don't want to allow Hamas to have assets that they need to continue to launch terror against Israelis. And we have a very clear mission, and we cannot allow Hamas any time to, re to reorganize, to regather themselves, because we have seen what they will do. We have seen, we, the world has seen it. We have seen as they've broadcasted it very loudly and proudly what they have done, and that is slaughter civilians, kill them in their beds. Uh, there is no way that we can live next to this side by side. And of course, we will facilitate the movement of, uh, of goods in to the civilians within the Gaza Strip. Uh, but Hamas in no way can expect to have a break or any time to, re to regroup and to continue their acts of terror against us. Well, you will know, uh, Libby, that fuel is becoming critical now. Uh, it provides electricities, electricity that powers hospitals. It is needed for uh, water and sewerage um, systems and to, and to allow for clean drinking water. People in Gaza are now drinking contaminated water. It's quickly uh, becoming a humanitarian catastrophe there. Is it realistic, I suppose, to, uh, to expect Hamas um, to give that, that fuel possibly to those humanitarian agencies? Are they even allowed to take it from Hamas, those international aid agencies there? Well, first, it's important to note that food, water, and medication is coming in to the Gaza Strip. But I think the question of whether it's realistic to expect of Hamas is a question that Hamas needs to answer and acknowledge uh, as the leaders of the, of the Gaza Strip. I mean, they have electricity. We know that they have that. We know that they have fuel. And the responsibility and the pressure here needs to be on Hamas to care for the well-being of their own civilians. Uh, but there can't be any expectation that we are going to provide Hamas with the resources to continue attacking our civilians. And it, in my view, it is on the international community to pressure Hamas and to validate that they are using the supplies that they have, that they're provide taking the supplies that they have and providing it to the civilians. Our government as well, Libby, is asking for these sort of safe zones, uh, designated safe areas that are strictly off limits as targets uh, that to protect innocent civilians from being killed in this conflict. Is that something that Israel is considering? Well, we have... Uh, updated, and we've we've asked the civilians in the northern part of the Strip to move to the southern part of the Strip. We've expressed that that is a safer area for them to be right now at this stage of the conflict. And we absolutely encourage them, and we encourage everyone to join in our calls for those civilians to move to areas to which we have designated as being safer at this point. I want to ask you um, just one final question. You know, it seems that governments and the international community agree that Israel absolutely has a right to defend itself. Uh, what happened on October 7 was barbaric. They were mass atrocities carried out by Hamas's military wing. But is this bombardment um, and a possible ground invasion, is that a proportional response by Israel? Absolutely. Uh, we have no other choice. Uh, and I think it is so important to emphasize this. We did not start this conflict. The, the citizens in Israel woke up on October 7th to a massacre that was taking place within our homes. We have no other choice. We cannot in any way bow our heads 
to Hamas because we know what they will do. They, they will decapitate us. We saw, we saw it happen. Uh, we cannot live with an enemy like this next door that not only ex vocally expresses their goal of wanting to wipe us off the map, but is proud to broadcast it as they are doing it, as they slaughter civilians. And I can't imagine that any country on earth would be able to live with that kind of threat next door and would not respond to do everything possible to protect its civilians. And that's, that's what we will do. Well, Major Libby Weiss, thanks so much for joining us here this morning. Thank you. Well, overnight, Gaza has been rocked by intensive airstrikes, losing communication links and internet. Aid agencies are warning of an impending humanitarian catastrophe there. And last night, I spoke to Hector Sharp. He is a Kiwi and he's head of legal at the United Nations Relief and Works Agency in Gaza. Good morning. Can you first of all describe the conditions in Gaza right now? Sure. The, the conditions in Gaza are terrible. We have over half a million uh, internally displaced persons. We call them IDPs, sheltering in our facilities. Um, and we are unable to, to, to provide them with their basic needs. And then we have also, you know, another, another 1.5 million in the community that are trying to find places to shelter or sheltering at home. And, and there is no place that is safe. So that's the safety situation, the, the sanitation, the overcrowding of the shelters and the lack of basic necessities compounds that into a very uh, significant humanitarian crisis that we're dealing with. Mm, and we know that fuel is critical to sustain life there right now and it is running out. Uh, it, it provides clean water, it provides power for hospitals, uh, but that fuel is in very short supply. Correct. We have been... Uh, We've been short on fuel from the start and we've done our utmost to ration that to continue to provide services and keep things like desalination plants functioning, bakeries functioning um, and, and water wells functioning. But now we're at a, at a crisis point where if we don't get fuel in the next you know, hours, um, we will you know, be in a position where we won't be able to offer, uh, the UN won't be able to offer the services that it needs for the people here. And what happens then, Hector? I, I, to be honest, I, I, I'm not sure. Um, we, we just have to hope we do not reach that point. And, and as I said, uh, Gavin, to you yesterday, I said, I believe that when we reach that point, the world will sit up and say, oh, yes, now we'll send fuel, but, but it will take days to organise and that will be too late. Um, to, to put it in, to put it the gravity of the situation, I have myself visited El Shifa Hospital where there are... 50,000 people sheltering and thousands of patients who need medical attention, including uh, prematurely born babies. That requires electricity. You cannot run a hospital without electricity. If that electricity goes off for more than a couple of hours, we're looking at a situation where there could be a mass casualty uh, incident there. Well, Israel is so far refusing to allow fuel to be brought into Gaza because it says uh, it, it may be used by Hamas, the military wing there, um, in, in their war. Um, we, it says that uh, Hamas has stockpiles of fuel that it could release. What is the situation that you're facing? Look, we're, we're running a humanitarian operation. Uh, we don't... We, we don't have any oversight over what other parties have. We are clearly communicating that we as the United Nations and the international humanitarian aid community, community which includes our partners, ICRC, Medicine Sans Frontiers and others, do not have the fuel um, that we need for our, for our operations. Is it even possible for operations or organisations like yours to take fuel from Hamas? Uh, we have... You know, I don't want to get into the mechanics of it. We we do not have uh, relationships that would would provide for that. The UN is impartial and independent, uh, and doesn't uh, take sides with either party of the conflict. So uh, that wouldn't be something that we uh, would be, um, you know, pursuing. As I said, the, the international community is responsible for providing a humanitarian response to Gaza through the United Nations as the, their representatives, um, and we need the tools to do that, which includes fuel. Well, New Zealand and other countries um, are calling now for a humanitarian pause in this conflict uh, to allow aid to flow uh, and people to evacuate from the north. What kind of difference would that make? Would it make a material difference to the situation there? 
Yeah, I, I saw the statement from New Zealand and other countries. And, and what I will say is this, is that New Zealand has a proud history of quiet diplomacy. Um, after all, it was New Zealand's work on the Security Council in 2016, which led to the first resolution condemning Israeli settlements in the West Bank. Um, but we've always stood very, very loudly and very proudly on the side of international humanitarian law and international law compliance. And therefore, I was surprised to read the, uh, the statement by the government, um, by my government, which calls for a humanitarian pause rather than a ceasefire. You think it wasn't strong enough, Hector, from our government? My personal view as a New Zealander, yes. My official view as, as a UN representative is that uh, we're impartial and, and we don't get involved in issues of politics. Yeah, absolutely. It's difficult, though, isn't it, when you're in a war zone? Um, what do you know about what's happening in northern Gaza? Are people being prevented from leaving um, northern Gaza right now? Look, communication is very difficult um, here. The, the telecom services are, have been down for a number of days and come back intermittently. There's no uh, internet. Um, so getting information about what's happening in the north is difficult. We, we're using the same sources that, uh, that you may be in, in terms of media on the ground. Um, but I, I, I'm not aware of, of, of people being prevented. Um, and, you know, as I said, we're, we're ready to provide assistance to people. And our mandate is to provide assistance to people wherever they are in Gaza, not just the south. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I was wondering earlier today, Hector, does Egypt have a greater role to play here? Could they facilitate the delivery of um, more aid supplies or fuel, for example? The Egyptians obviously have a, have a key role to play, uh, and I believe that um, all, all surrounding countries are doing, are doing their best to facilitate uh, the entry of aid. Um, it, I won't comment on specific uh, responsibilities of individual countries, but um, I'm aware of high-level high level negotiations and, and strategizing to, to help the people of Gaza, um, including on the Egyptian side. And in terms of the other aid that is getting through, it is just a trickle, isn't it? It is insufficient to support uh, what is happening there right now. Uh, absolutely. And the UN's been very clear on this, is that 20 trucks a day, 14 trucks a day, this is not going to solve the humanitarian crisis. Um, we, before the conflict, we had an average of 500 trucks coming to Gaza on a daily basis. Uh, Gaza has been under um, has been under a blockade for uh, almost 15 years, and you know is, is reliant on a, on a, on imports, um, and that, those have stopped largely for two weeks. So, we've been calling for uh, more aid to come through in a continuing pipeline, and, and we haven't seen the fruits of that uh, advocacy yet. Uh, Hector, we've just um, spoken to the Israeli Defence Force, who is still talking about a ground invasion. How is that, um, I suppose, sitting with people in Gaza right now? I think from the start of the conflict, there's been a, a general uh, level of fear um, about a ground invasion. I mean, the last ground invasion was 2014 and had uh, you know, severe humanitarian consequences. Um, so there, that is a fear. And, and as I said, we're, we're calling for a ceasefire, which would, would uh, halt that. Um, and, and those efforts continue. Just finally, I suppose, you know, what do you want New Zealanders to understand? It can feel very far away, but we are all seeing these images every night on our televisions and they are horrifying. What um, do you want people here to understand about what is happening in Gaza? First of all, I want to say thank you for watching. So, you know, the first step is to not turn away. Um, take that information in and, 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 and act accordingly. Um, you know, the, the uh, New Zealand is, is a key part of the international community. Um, and as I said, we've always stood on the side of international law. Um, and it's, it's the public and the people of New Zealand that uh, need to ensure that our proud history continues. Well, Hector Sharp, thank you so much for joining us here this morning on The Nation. You're very welcome. Good to speak with you. And we had had reports this morning that UN workers in Gaza had been killed uh, in that military action overnight, but we have confirmed that Hector is safe.